Today I want to take a look at 10 C-sharp attributes that I've come across over the last few weeks in newer Unity projects and systems. These come from a wide range of libraries, including .NET, Unity Scripting, JetBrains Annotations, and Open Source. Whether you decide to use these in your projects or not is up to you, but at the very least, you'll know what they are when you run into them during your programming journey. We're going to start with something very interesting and technical from the Unity Behavior Package. Hit the like button as soon as you learn something new today. For this first example, I want to dive into the Unity Behavior Package. Unity has a new class here, Serializable Good, that I've been using a little bit lately. It's very similar to the Serializable Good class that we wrote last year on this channel, but it has some additional features, the first of which is this struct layout attribute. In C Sharp, the struct layout attribute is used to control how the fields of a struct are laid out in memory. You can see here that we're passing in an enum to the constructor of this attribute. If we pass in layout kind dot explicit, that gives us complete control over the memory layout of the struct fields using another attribute called field offset, which we're going to look at in just a minute. You can specify sequential if you want all the members to be laid out in memory in the same order they appear inside of your struct. This is the default behavior. You can also specify auto, which means that the CLR will try to optimize the byte structure of your struct, but because you have no control over the layout of your struct fields anymore, you can't use it in unmanaged code. That means you wouldn't be able to pass this struct into jobs or burst, for example. So let's set it back to explicit, and then we're going to take a look at this field offset attribute. Just hit page down here, and we'll go and look at the first field. Here we have a member of type hash 128, and right above it we have a field offset attribute, which we're passing in zero to the constructor. This means that our hash 128 field starts at the zeroth byte of the struct. What's really interesting about this implementation is if you look down a little bit, we have two ulong fields here, and the first one also starts with a field offset of zero, and the other one is at eight. So what's going on here? Why would we want to place two variables at the exact same spot in memory? Well, the comment by the hash 128 gives us a clue. For various reasons of its implementation, we can't actually display that hash 128 struct in the Unity inspector. However, we can display two serialized ulong fields. This is actually a very clever way of dealing with a complicated struct like the hash 128 and allow you to be able to see and change the values inside of Unity. Let's scroll down a little bit and take one more lesson from this particular struct. Here we have the preserve attribute. So the preserve attribute is used to prevent the compiler or runtime from stripping or optimizing away the marked fields or properties. This is common in scenarios like game dev where unused methods, properties, or fields might be stripped out during build time to reduce the size of the output. But for whatever reason, some members must be preserved for maybe reflection or dynamic access of some kind. This attribute comes from the Unity Engine.scripting namespace. Now, code stripping is sometimes useful, especially in small builds, but sometimes you just don't want your code to be stripped at all, even if it looks like it's not used. So you can use the preserve attribute on classes, methods, properties, and fields. Now, this is as far as we're going to dive into the code of the behavior package today, but if you're in Rider and you want to have a closer look at what's going on, head up to the top menu. Under Navigate, choose Select In, and then choose Explorer, and it'll take you right to this file in the package. You could also hit Shift-Shift, and you'll be able to find it. There's the serialization package in there. There's the Blackboard. There's all kinds of interesting stuff. But this is a video about attributes, so let's move on. For this next attribute, I'm going to start a new class here. It's called Example. It'll be a mono behavior. But first, we're going to define an enum. Now, I'm just making something up for this example, but let's suppose we have three values here, auto, uint16, and uint32. Now, none of those are particularly meaningful, and if we were to expose this as a public member of our example class, people might not have any idea what we're talking about, and that's where this next attribute becomes useful. The inspector name attribute can be used with enum values to change the display name shown in the inspector. So if we give a more meaningful name to values 1 and 2, we'll have an easier time using this enum from the inspector. Let's go have a look. So let's zoom into the inspector a little bit. Now in the dropdown, we're going to see our nicely formatted names. And one of the nicer features, I think, is that now you can search based on those inspector names. In many cases, this is going to make your enums a lot more user friendly. This next attribute, I know a lot of you are already familiar with default execution order. For a long time, this was actually undocumented. 
This attribute is used to set the execution order for monobehavior derived scripts. Scripts are executed in order from lowest first to highest last. So for example, negative 50 will execute before one that's marked with 1000. There is one gotcha with this attribute and to show that we're going to go back into Unity. In Unity, you can set the execution order under project settings, script execution order. If you just hit the plus icon, you can start adding any mono behavior type script right in here. In a lot of cases, this is easier to use, but the gotcha I want to mention is that if you specify it in code and you specify a default execution order here, the one that you specify here in Unity is going to take priority and it's going to ignore your other value. So just keep that in mind. The next three attributes actually come from jetbrains.annotations, and these generally exist to help you get better hints inside of Rider. So here, take note of the not null attribute that's being used inside the method signature. Maybe the first interesting point about this is that many people don't realize that you can use attributes on parameters. When you're defining an attribute, you can set the attribute usage, and one of those options is parameter. So not null here doesn't actually prevent us from sending nulls in, but what it does do is gives us a nice hint in the inspector. So let's go back to our example and make a usage of this. I'll just come down a few lines and add a new statement here where we call that extension method. But here I'm going to call it on a null. I'm just going to cast null as a type. Right away you can see that's underlined in yellow because we're getting a warning from that attribute. And if we hover over, we'll get a little bit of help text. So the not null attribute actually has an inverse, which is called can be null. Let's come back over into the extension method and we can change it right here in the signature. This would mean that we allow nulls and we handle them inside the method. Let's go back into our other class. I mean, we'll see right away, of course, that the yellow warning is gone because we're allowed to send a null into here. Just before we move on, I'm going to revert that change back to not null the way that it was. For this next attribute, I'm actually going to create a new method in our example class. And this method would be something that we might call dynamically, maybe from reflection. So just for an example, let's create a start method where we actually get that method using reflection and invoke it. If we zoom out a little bit down in the corner, we have these little crayon icons where if you click on them, you can change the highlight level in Rider. So right now I have it set to error only, but I'm going to take it all the way up to hints. And now you can see that a lot of the things in my class are actually grayed out because they're unused, or at least the IDE thinks they're not being used. Now we know the load data method is being called by reflection. So in a bigger project, and especially if you are working on a team, you can use the used implicitly attribute, and that will tell the IDE not to kind of signal that this is an unused method. That'll keep you from accidentally deleting it or, you know, maybe one of your teammates accidentally deleting it and causing some kind of problem. Now I'm going to add the preserve attribute that we talked about earlier here because I want to make it clear what the difference is between these two things. So preserve prevents code stripping during the build. That's not the same thing as used implicitly. Used implicitly is just to suppress the warnings in the IDE. So another way to think about it is that preserve is used to keep unity from stripping out the method. Used implicitly is to try to prevent you from stripping out the method. So the writer annotations are really helpful hints to prevent you from doing foolish things in your code. I'm just going to go back to the error level because I know it's sometimes hard to read the gray text. For this next attribute, I want to come back in here to Unity and to Project Settings under Editor. If we zoom in a little bit here, you'll see under Asset Serialization, we have several different modes. Now, most of the time, you're going to see this in Force Text, which means that files like scriptable objects are going to be human readable. You'll be able to open them up in Notepad and understand what they are. Force Binary here means that it's going to try to encode everything in binary format. It won't be readable, but it will have faster I.O. operations and it will take up less disk space. The big trade off here is that if you put everything into binary, you're not going to be able to merge it with other commits. For example, if you were to make changes to a scriptable object in Unity, you can't just merge it with a previous version or a version that someone else is working on. Instead, you just have to overwrite the old one. I think for most projects, leaving it as force text is suitable. However, sometimes you might run into a situation where you have a scriptable object that is just enormous. Maybe it has so much data in it that it's just getting out of control, or maybe it has other children nested inside of it. Either way, you have most of your scriptable objects in text format, but you want this one to be in binary. And for that, you can use the prefer binary serialization attribute. 
Now, I realize this is kind of self-explanatory, but why don't we explore it just a little bit? I'm going to move this into its own file, and then we can go back into Unity. I'll let Hot Reload do its thing, and we'll create one of these scriptable objects. So just very quickly here, I'll open up the context menu under Create. We can create a new My Data. I'll create one entry in the array and just give it a value of one. Let's keep it super simple here and go back to code. If we open up this binary file in Rider, you're going to see a whole lot of hexadecimal values. Now, this is completely useless to 99.9% .9 of people who watch this channel. These days, it's probably only meaningful to people who used to hack their games as teenagers in the x86 era. The good news is you can always convert this back. So if we come back into my scriptable object here and remove the attribute, go back into Unity and let the compiler run again, the next time we go look at this file, it's going to be in a nice human readable and mergeable format. So long as you didn't mess around with it while it was in binary format. So I think in most cases, just keep it in this readable format. And if you want to stay in this format, but you want to have some of your scriptable objects be optimized into binary, you can use that attribute. Let's come back over to the example class. I'm going to remove the default execution order attribute. Instead, I'm going to put in selection base. Now, this one is best understood if we look at it in Unity. At the moment, my example script that has the selection base attribute on it is at my top level enemy game object. If I were to select something else, maybe the model, which is the first child there, and then click on my enemy inside the scene view, you'll see it automatically selected my enemy game object again. And that's because of the selection base attribute. If I drag the example script onto the child where the model is, and maybe I don't select anything at all, now when I select my enemy in the scene, it selects the model instead of the top level enemy object because the model is where the example script is. I'm sure you can imagine how this can be extremely useful in some scenarios. Okay, last attribute for today comes from open source. It was actually created by Kyle Banks for his video game Farewell North. Kyle had a big problem with his game in that he had many, many calls to get component and get component in children. So instead he devised an attribute that will validate and find all these references ahead of time so that he didn't have a thousand get component calls when his game started up. You can install this library in the normal way. I'll put a link to it in the description. And then you just have a using call to kbcore.refs. And to use this attribute, we're going to create a new serialized field and we're going to add the attribute child. This means I want to find an animator that is on one of the children of this component. Then in onValidate, we'll use the extension method validate refs that will execute code that will find and set that reference to the animator. An alternative way is to use a validated mono behavior, which is just an extension of a mono behavior, which will do this for you. And child isn't the only type of attribute you can use here. Instead of child, you could set parent, and that would look for an animator in any of the parents of this game object. You could also use self if you're looking for something on this game object. And you can also use anywhere, which essentially is just a null check. You still have to drag the reference in yourself. So in a way, this whole system is a little bit like a poor man's dependency injection. Let's take a quick look in Unity. You can see in the inspector that on my example script, the animator field already has a reference, and that's because hot reload ran as soon as I came back into Unity. And that, of course, caused the onValidate method to run, and so it went and found our reference already. But you can also do it just by using the context menu. You can validate references on a component anytime, or even better than that, you can go up to the tools menu, and there's a special section here now where you can validate all the refs here. You can get everything in this whole project done in one swoop, and it will tell you in the console if you're missing anything, if there were any problems, or if everything is good. We now have references to everything we need. The project is ready to go. So for those of you who are using a lot of get component or get component in children, and you find that it's causing your game to take a long time to start up, then this is probably the open source library for you. And we've used it on the channel before. I really like it. I think it's great. And that's where we're going to wrap up the video too. So whether or not you decide to use any of the attributes we've covered today, I hope that at the very least, if you see them out there in the wild, you'll know what they mean. And so I'll just say, join us on Discord if you feel like discussing anything that you saw here or in other videos. Like and subscribe if you want to catch another video every Sunday. I'll put something else up on the screen in case you feel like watching something else from the channel. Maybe I'll see you there.